give you a few perspectives of the cyanobacteria monitoring efforts being uh, taking place in Region 1. Um, <clears throat> basically, what I'd like to do today over the next 35, 40 minutes is just talk to you uh, about the basic approach that we've employed within the region, uh, the methods and tools that we're uh, applying at this point in time, and then uh, an overview of how we're addressing the data that is being collected. So in looking at how we came about uh, getting to this point in the first place, <clears throat> around 2012 we had a, uh, started to get requests in from states, 2012-2013, about how to address the HAB issue. It was starting to uh, rise to uh, public's attention. And so we were getting requests in the region from the states, and states were getting uh, inquiries from the general public at large about uh, blooms happening uh, in their vicinities. Uh, at that point in time, as there still seems to be today, there's not really a good, clear picture of the prevalence or ubiquity of HABs in the region here, in blooms. And we also, at that point, noticed that, uh, realized that it was a moving target, not only within from a regional perspective, but also even from a within lake uh, perspective. As you can see from this little heat map here from the University of New Hampshire, it shows the um, concentration of cyanobacteria cells within an individual water body at a point in time. So we knew it was a pretty big moving target from the get-go. We also realized that there was a need at multiple levels. Uh, as we realized people were taking um, chlorine tablets and throwing them off the end of their dock to kind of take care of algal problems. Uh, to drinking water suppliers that realized that they had uh, <clears throat> potential issues with their operations uh, with this looming problem. So there's a need for the educational end of it. There's also a need for collecting data within the region on a, on a larger scale um, that we could aggregate and make some, uh, come to some conclusions. And then also a need for um, data to be collected as a resource management tool, not only in the from a regional perspective, uh, from a policy end, but also from a actual hands-on uh, water body <clears throat> itself. Um, really. So just a couple of uh, little pictures here, which uh, kind of uh, looks at the progression of how things have gone over the past few years. Uh, more and more attention seems to be being paid to the issue uh, for good reason. Um, so I think in 2013, we finally got the states together, along with other entities, and started to uh, develop a work group. Um, <clears throat> in the initial, uh, we came up uh, initially with what we figured a monitoring program should encompass. Uh, we felt based from the previous slide discussion that it needed to be multi-tiered. We needed an educational component uh, of it to um, make the general public more aware of the issue, all the way up through uh, expanding to a level that hopefully we could use it as a uh, risk assessment, vulnerability assessment tool, and uh, a resource management potentially for uh, folks such as water quality um, folks and drinking water operators. Uh, we also realize it needs to be low budget uh, and technically sound um, in order to incorporate lake associations, volunteer monitoring folks, um, and even drinking water suppliers in the regions with minimal budget uh, and big budget constraints. Um, it needed to keep the cost down. Uh, it also needed technical rigor so that we could um, upscale it to the larger uh, regional effort and still uh, keep data integrity intact. Um, implementation had to be uh, relatively simple. Uh, it's hard enough uh, today with people with such uh, busy schedules and uh, limited resources to add one more thing to folks' plate. Uh, so we want to make sure it was simplistic and, and potentially incorporated into already existing programs. Um, we also needed uh, methods that were standardized across the region. As a lot of you folks probably know on the line, that it's very difficult to aggregate data when everybody is doing things in a different manner with different tools and different times and different resources. Uh, I spoke about the educational level and the utility for uh, upscaling it. Uh, we also felt there's a need to address ambient waters, not necessarily just bloom conditions. Our feelings were that by the time a bloom occurs, it's kind of almost after the fact that you're looking at toxin analysis and you're looking at uh, hazards in the water body. It'd be nice to uh, track it through the course of a bloom or track these waters where um, blooms may not have previously existed. And then the last thing on here is uh, 
uh, commensurate QA. We felt that the quality assurance that's involved with the monitoring needs to really match the complexity of, of the monitoring that's taking place. So I'd like to thank up front, these are uh, uh, just a listing of the work group participants uh, that have taken, uh, that have participated in our work group. And I just want to uh, thank them for their enthusiastic participation. These folks uh, have all either currently or in the recent past have helped participate and contribute to this uh, regional problem. And they're a pretty active uh, group. They, we meet usually on a quarterly basis, if not more, uh, on addressing the issue and the little nuances of the monitoring program. Um, so after 2013, when we got folks together to talk about how we were going to approach it, uh, we did a basically a pilot year, which was 2014, and that came off pretty successful. Uh, we had a little over 100 lakes that we monitored that year uh, with about 3,000 individual data points collected during that summer. Uh, and it consisted of a wide variety of of um, work group members from state water quality agencies, we had citizen volunteers, we had university researchers and university extension services involved, and also uh, some regional water suppliers. <clears throat> 2015 uh, was also pretty much the same as far as the number of lakes sampled and data points collected. Um, so this is my third grade cartoon of kind of our program here which is basically composed of three main components. It has a bloom watch component, a cyanoscope component, and a cyanomonitoring component. And these all overlap to a certain extent. <clears throat> and as you can see, we start with a basic bloom watch, which is primarily an educational component with some valuable data collected, and gets increasing in complexity to the cyanomonitoring end of things, where we feel that data is useful for water management water body management. And as we move from the, the Bloom Watch to Sano monitoring, uh, training and expertise increases, costs, data and information increase, as does our quality insurance, quality assurance. <clears throat> so basically I'll go through each one of these components, uh, talk a little bit about them. Uh, Bloom Watch is basically the goal of this is to basically just look at the spatial and temporal patterns uh, of Bloom's in the region and the documentation of the occurrence of a bloom. Uh, this is considered by the group to be the bare bones, uh, basic uh, crowdsourcing tool. Um, and it's geared for the person that might just be walking their dog is in the picture here that's next to a water body um, and sees that the bloom is occurring or something looks uh, funky in the water. Um, <clears throat> by using nothing more than their smartphone and an app that we've developed, they can take a picture, document that location, send that data into a database, and then we have a document of a probable occurrence of a, of a bloom. <clears throat> um, the data is a uh, public domain, uh, is where the data is uh, to be housed. Again, we look at this as a, uh, as a regional work group with so many members, the data isn't really considered to be EPAs, it's considered the work groups, and it is out there in the public domain. So I will go through the apps a little bit, just to give people a feel for kind of where we are with, uh, with app development. This is the Bloomwatch app for the smartphone. Uh, it has four different screens, uh, basically an introduction and basic info, uh, <clears throat> lake conditions, a photo screen, and then the submission of data screen. Uh, <clears throat> The first screen uh, just shows uh, kind of an introduction to the Bloom Watch, um, <coughs> excuse me, stating what blooms are, what the app does, who we are that are collecting um, the data, or trying to get the data collected, and then how to proceed uh, with the app itself. Uh, this was piloted last year. Uh, it's going through some tweaks now. Hopefully by um, this summer we'll have it all uh, up and ready for everyone to use. Uh, we hope to install a little video training clip. Sometimes people prefer to look at a, a clip on how to rather than go ahead and read through a lot of text. Um, very simple with the forms, uh, name, email address. The email address can be put in there, so if you want the images uh, 
that you took sent directly to your email as well as the database, they will be sent to you. Or if you're a member of a lake association, you want to go to a lake association, you can send it uh, to them as well. <clears throat> and then a lake name is entered. There's a lookup table here, a lookup button, so if you had put that lake name in once, you can go back to your smartphone and look it up from a previous uh, time that you uh, took a photo. And what that does, it helps the database keep the um, text formatting uh, the same so you don't have problems in the database, uppercase, lowercase, or, or typos and that sort of thing that can confound the data. Um, simple screens, uh, you see there's some uh, formatting issues here that have to be taken care of. It's very simple, date, uh, we wanted to know, uh, kind of had a little bit of an indication of how busy the water body might be from a recreational standpoint, so we were interested in knowing if there was a public beach or a, a boat launch. Uh, weather conditions, surface conditions, very simple, four different choices, basically overcast, raining, partly cloudy or sunny. Same for surface conditions, you know, is it white caps out there, is it calm, is it ripples? Um, and then for the bloom size, the extent of the bloom, we kind of followed the uh, uh, National Lakes Assessment kind of protocol where they just use um, kind of general guidelines for um, assessment. You know, is it bigger than a tennis court, smaller than a football field, larger than a football field, whole lake, that sort of thing, just to get a, an idea of the extent of the bloom. And then you can put in general comments. At the end of each page, is a save data, so you save that data as you move along. Um, and the photo screen, uh, this is where we have the bare bones QA that uh, kind of incorporate into the app itself, where we state specifically what type of picture we're looking for. Uh, so photo one, you want to know what the area extent of the lake is. You want an image that shows you know, the extent of the bloom to the best you can. So if it's whole lake, you try to get as much of the lake as possible that's going to show that bloom. Um, and then you take that coordinate. This, uh, uh, when you hit get coordinates, that will pull that right off of your phone and populate those fields for you. Um, <clears throat> another photo two, we have actually four photos that we would like people to collect. Um, the next one is a photo that is a little closer in distance, depicted in the picture to the right here, uh, where you get more of a close up of of the bloom if possible, um, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> when you're done collecting the photos, um, you can review your data, what, what lake it is or pond, what the date is, and then submit your data. <clears throat> so your photos don't take up a ton of room on your phone. You can also delete uh, the photos from your phone after, after you've submitted the data. Um, so that's basically the BloomWatch app. Um, again, Four different photos in there showing the aerial coverage of the bloom, close picture, macro photo if possible. Um, we're still debating on possibly a float test picture, which basically is uh, if you put <clears throat> cyanobacteria in a job a lot of time or in a jar, a lot of times the bloom forming cyanobacteria will float to the surface in a picture of that. But that's still up in the air. And then the video training I mentioned earlier. And this should be available. Um, by June, we hope that's completed and finished. Um, where the data is anticipated to be housed, um, this point is, uh, is ongoing work with sitsci.org. A lot of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, it's crowdsourced, sourcing um, public-facing website um, where you can accumulate data and, uh, for specific projects that you put into the into the um, <coughs> web page. And uh, one reason we like this is because it already has data visualization tools already built into it. Uh, it makes it simplistic from our standpoint to utilize some of these. Um, and it also has mapping tools. So when this is done and up and running, if people wanted to utilize this tool out in Montana or other parts of the country, they could certainly do that using the same app and um, find it into sitside.org. So that's the bloom watch component. The next component is our cyanoscope. And basically the goal of this component is to look at the distribution of cyanobacteria across the region with the potential for possibly uh, mapping toxin-producing water bodies based on the uh, 
um, species that are within the water body. And this uh, basically came about through a, an ORD NHRL ideation grant, which we competed for. We're one of two groups um, that uh, were awarded this grant. Basically, it's geared towards uh, kind of pilot projects for incorporating data utilizing citizen science. Um, we've incorporated low-cost tools, which I'll show you in a, in a minute, uh, with some specific techniques involved, sample collection, separation. Uh, it's not a temporally based data collection, so we're not really concerned about um, methodically collecting data through the course of the summer and fall when blooms occur. Uh, there is an image-based capture protocol that's established for this. Uh, it is an image database, and again, it's uh, to be housed in public domain data. <clears throat> um, little, two different designs that we have here uh, is, is an onshore data collection and uh, on lake or in lake. It's geared for uh, most of the folks in the region here, boards of health, beach programs, a lot of their sampling takes place from the shore. They want to make sure that we could capture that uh, group of practitioners. And then the on-lake folks that might be lake associations, <clears throat> water quality folks that are out on the lake. Um, we incorporated a one meter uh, integrated tube sample for the collection methodology. Uh, within the lake, it is a three meter integrated tube sample, uh, usually taken close to the deep spot. Uh, from three different areas to show within lake variability. And also, three meters was decided on so that we were ensured that we'd collect at least most of the photic zone uh, within the water body. <clears throat> and it was geared to uh, complement currently existing uh, monitoring programs uh, as an add-on if folks uh, saw fit to, to incorporate it. Um, we developed these cyanoscope kits. Um, <clears throat> this is what they look like. Uh, simple tools, low cost. Uh, currently, uh, we're looking at $640 for this kit if you include uh, the digital opt optics uh, for the microscope, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, but the kit basically includes the integrated tube, uh, some little DI spritzers here, uh, the carrying case. This is a student microscope that we found uh, for less than $100. Uh, it's battery operated, so you can use it in the field. Uh, we've enhanced it a little bit. Uh, we also have a, a kit here full of microscope slides and cover slips. Uh, this was one of the original versions of the microscope, which I'll get into in a minute, of attaching your this uh, hookup. It's called to your microscope, and then your cell phone sits in a cradle, uh, and you can take images that way. Uh, plankton net, thermometer basic sample jars, and then what is called a zapper here, which basically uh, concentrates your cyanobacteria, which I will explain. So the evolution of this, uh, and this I think is kind of one of the powers of the diverse work group that we have, is, is that a lot of people come up with some great ideas and they evolve as we, as we go on uh, with the program. Originally for the microscope, uh, someone found online the ability to use a laser pointer, <clears throat> take the lens out of that laser pointer, embed it in some plexiglass, and uh, mount that on some little bolts, and you basically have a, a very simple $10 or less microscope. Uh, the images weren't bad that came out of this, uh, but it didn't quite have the resolution that we wanted for the cyanoscope. So that then evolved into the hookups unit, which is, I think it's made by Carson, it's called, and basically just clips onto your microscope you put your cell phone in the cradle, which aligns your optics of your cell phone with the optics of the microscope, and you can take images. And the app is designed to take those images and send them directly then to the database. <clears throat> Finally, this is our kind of final version of, of where we've evolved to. Uh, this is a digital microscope optics with uh, just a USB that goes to micro USB right to your cell phone. So you take images using this out in the field. <clears throat> right at the lakeside or on your boat if you want. Take those images, put them into your app, and send them off to the database. Um, so this is the tool that we're currently uh, utilizing at this point. Um, and the intent here is, is to be able to take a picture of a bloom, capture that image, and then look at the finer detail of what actually comprises that 
uh, what the composition of that broom is. Um, and the QA, uh, again, we're going to a little bit uh, higher level of quality assurance. But this is basically a standard SOP for how to capture the image, what kind of images we want, where to send them, how to select your um, coordinate feature, um, your GPS feature on your phone on, and so forth. Okay. Where does the data go? Uh, right now it's going into inaturalist.org. Many of you have probably heard of this website. <coughs> it's an image-based um, um, citizen science kind of webpage where you can collect your images um, for your project. Um, the cyanoscope is up now. We tested this, uh, basically did the pilot again last summer. Um, we do have this, if you go to Cyanoscope or go to iNaturalist, you can look up Cyanoscope and see it. And we've started collecting images. Um, if you do go to the site, you might be a little disappointed on what you see because, again, it's just in the pilot phase. We need to clean up and put in, uh, get some really nice images. But we just wanted to populate it, see how things are working at this point in time. So the value is anyone can use this. <clears throat> the images that are put in here, the way it works is that uh, you can put in an image and then it will be verified uh, by consensus. So the thought is that you get uh, people that are experts in the field can verify what the image is and through that consensus you go from a regular quality image to what they consider a research grade image that is verified by experts. And you start to build this library of where uh, particular species or genuses are found within the region and you can map them and track them. Uh, <clears throat> there are caveats to using this type of technology, and there's a nice uh, paper that came out by uh, Wiggins and Hay, and uh, you might want to look at that if you're looking to dive into citizen science a little bit more and incorporate some of that data. Um, it's a nice, nice paper. Um, I have the reference here for you. Um, the Bloomwatch cyanoscope component, the low budget, they're readily available tools, it's simplistic data collection. And simplistic transfer uh, to public domain websites. Uh, the data is informative and it's universally available. Um, <clears throat> in addition to having those apps developed, uh, one of the folks in our work group, uh, the, well, actually the University of New Hampshire, a team there developed an, uh, an addendum or an enhancement to uh, the cyanoscope component where he developed the dirty dozen key cyanobacteria key for New England lakes. And basically what it is, it's top dozen cyanobacteria found within the region uh, that are toxin producers. And, um, this is available, I put the link down below. Folks, you can go in, you can look at your microscope slide and a person that's out in the field can actually use this tool to verify and hone in on actually what they are looking at. Um, is a general description of what you're seeing, many images on, on what um, <clears throat> the bacteria might look like uh, in the water, and then a little more detail uh, about the bacteria itself. Um, so that's a nice little tool and enhancement that basically came out of the work group and the collaborative efforts um, here. Uh, how we're going to promote it, uh, this has just been built by other members within the work group from our Atlantic Ecology Division. This is just a, um, kind of a brochure flyer to take to lake associations and other water quality folks uh, to get them introduced to Cyanoscope. It's just a three trifold uh, kind of listing what the program is, what cyanobacteria are, and then how to get started and how to get involved. Um, so another little tool that we're using uh, to promote uh, data gathering in the region. Then the last component we have is the cyano monitoring. As you can tell by the picture, it's where we start to get into the science. Science here, <clears throat> and mainly it's for uh, tracking uh, cyanobacteria concentrations in the region of water bodies uh, in ambient waters uh, to help forecast and track the occurrence of blooms, um, and also in the future to help determine risk um, and look at human health um, vulnerability. So this is more of the standardized methodology. There is an app development 
uh, is taking place. Again, the same toolkits are used with some tweaks. Uh, it's centralized data, which is uh, the database's uh, uh, web page for this data housing is being developed uh, at this point in time. It's not there yet. And data visualization tools and how we're going to uh, present the data after to the public is still in the works as well. And there's discussions going on with the work group about how that should be done and how we'd like to see it. So basically, the sampling methodology, kind of simplistically stated, is we have on lake and shoreside sampling for the general cyanobacterium monitoring. It could be either or. And then for um, a new development from this past summer, looking at potentially forecasting of blooms, uh, this is on lake uh, data collection sampling. This does have a temporal component in order to track the progression of cyanobacteria. In the lake, we need weekly sampling to take place. Uh, that is one of the uh, protocols for the monitoring. Um, general monitoring, we use an integrated tube, again, three meters in length to capture that photic zone. Uh, we separate the bloom forming cyanobacteria. Uh, we also use a fluorometer, so we're measuring uh, phycocyanin and chlorophyll A in the water sample, utilizing microscopy. And we're also freezing our samples. Uh, the forecasting, the only real difference is that um, we're using a secchi disk with that. Um, and really that's one of the only differences that there is. So some folks have had some questions in the past about why we freeze our samples, and that's an important component of our sampling methodology. And there's a couple different reasons. Uh, one is that. Samples can be collected at all different times of the day under all different types of weather conditions, and that's going to change um, <clears throat> potentially the cyanobacteria uh, fluorescence within, within the water body. So by freezing, it kind of normalizes that, um, that component, takes the weather component out of it. It also helps to uh, lyse the cells and get rid of some of the detritus and uh, stuff that's within the sample. Also, oops. Pardon me. Also, what we're finding is that by freezing these samples, uh, the fluorescence increases uh, significantly on those thawed samples. Anywhere from two to four times, we'll get an increased fluorescence uh, versus what we find in the ambient water. So this gives us also the uh, potential opportunity to look at water bodies where we might not pick up that signal uh, on the instrument because it might be below the detection level of the barometer under ambient conditions, but once we freeze and thaw that sample, we'll be able to pick up the signal. So it, it adds a little more capability for us uh, on water bodies that might be uh, more oligotrophic in nature. Clear. Okay. The same kit, uh, basically, uh, used a little differently. And um, you know, some of these things might be missing in the bloom watch and, and cyanoscope. Or it may not be necessary, but this is the complete kit for uh, the cyanide monitoring. And I have circled here the, the zapper, as it's called. Um, this is a tool that was developed out of uh, our work group by Nancy Leland. And basically, what it does is it concentrates the cyanobacteria uh, for you in the water sample. So you put your, your ambient sample in the tube, set it aside for a while. <clears throat> Whoops, sorry. Um, hang on the side of your bag, let it sit, and what will happen is the zooplankton will migrate to the light, concentrate at the bottom of this um, sample tube, and your cyanobacteria, their bloom forming, will, will float through respiration and buoyancy to the surface. So after a specific hold time, your tube will concentrate the cyanobacteria at the top, zooplankton will go to the bottom, and you will um, you know, to have a more concentrated uh, cyanobacteria reading and a cyanobacteria population. So for a microscope image, it's nice because you get rid of a lot of the non-cyanobacteria stuff that's in there. You get nice, better image quality. And also, as you can see from this graph, looking at the different partitioning uh, down through the uh, zapper here, you can see that after about a two-hour hold time, your phycocyanin reading goes up significantly. So the tool we use for uh, looking at fluorescence, 
uh, is a um, handheld field fluorometer. There's several types available out there. Uh, the measurement range for the chlorophyll is in there from 0.25 to 2,500 micrograms per liter, and the phycocyanin is 10 to 100,000. Uh, we're working now on trying to bring that uh, minimum detection level down a little bit, if possible, for the phycocyanin. Uh, they range anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500, depending on what brand you buy. Um, standards are approximately $200 a piece for calibrating. It's a two-month shelf life, so you have to do that pretty much right away. Calibrations usually are good for a year or better. And then you can get rhodamine uh, solid-state standards to track the instrument drift through the course of your sampling uh, period. Um, so through the monitoring group, uh, how do we keep track using these kinds of instruments so that our quality assurance is good and we can have reliability in our measurements? Uh, one of the things we do is have uh, an annual meter madness, um, I guess free for all, where we bring all the instruments together and we calibrate them all at the same time, all under the same conditions, all with the same uh, calibrators, stuff so we have consistency across the, the region with that. Um, it makes for a long day, but it's it's good for quality assurance. So then what we can do is we can do a standard control charts, um, looking at our calibrators, look at what the variation is across the mean of, of all the instruments uh, between two and three standard deviations, see where the instruments fall. And then we also run through a dilution series um, through the course of the um, calibration process, oops, sorry folks, um, to see where we start losing our, our ability to read the, read the standard. Um, the other QA uh, thing that we employ uh, is in the field. Uh, and this is the secondary standard log sheet which goes out with all instruments so that every time they go out to measure a sample or on a sampling day, they can record the temperature look at the phycocyanin and the chlorophyll and actually track to see if there's any changes in, in the instrument readings and sensitivity through the course of the sampling uh, season. And then we accumulate that data and look at it at the end of the season and see how the instruments are holding up um, or if they need to be recalibrated sooner than that. Um, SOPs, sampling analysis plans, we have developed these for the program. Uh, they need to be kind of collated together into our beloved uh, quality assurance project plan, which will be finalized uh, by June of this year. Um, but basically, we have a lot of ensure quality assurance. We have a lot of these already developed uh, and in place. So just a little bit, uh, I have a couple of slides here on uh, some interesting work that Nancy Leland from our work group has done over this past summer, uh, which has caught our attention. And basically, she has looked at the relationships between uh, phycocyanin uh, measurement and the readings between the phycocyanin and chlorophyll A ratio. Um, she did this and noticed that we can um, get some more information basically out of that um, PC chlorophyll A ratio than we can out of phycocyanin by itself. Um, <clears throat> but you notice this. Uh, here, um, trend between lakes. So basically, if we look at this slide here, and we look at just the phycocyanin measurement, you can see a trend taking place within one lake and not within the other. As we compare the PC chlorophyll A, now we start to see the trend taking place in the other lake as well. So it's just a more uh, fine-tuned um, measurement of what's going on within the water body. Um, here's a better picture of, of that uh, trend. Um, so this is really interesting data because what it does is it kind of the PC chlorophyll A tells us, um, kind of shows where that transition takes place between the green algae dying off mid to late summer and the phycocyan or the blue-green algae, uh, blue-green cyanobacteria taking over and out competing it. We see that transition um, sorry, taking place. Uh, here you see this transis, trans, uh, transition. Let me see here. 
to do this. I don't do it. But you see the transition taking place around the end of July. And Nancy traced this with uh, related to psyche disc readings at the same point in time. She noticed that this uh, trend in the PC chlorophyll A ratio uh, preceded the decline in psyche disc readings by um, at least a couple weeks here, um, which leads to an interesting um, thought is that possibly what we can do is we can predict a bloom before it occurs by several weeks using this PC chlorophyll A ratio. So this is a preliminary work that Nancy's done, and I'm not doing the best job of explaining it here. Um, but if you see a psyche disc reading and you assume that a bloom would occur up in this area here, if we can predict two to three weeks out uh, prior to a bloom occurring, that could be a very useful tool uh, for beach folks, for water suppliers, um, and other uh, lake water quality managers. So that's some interesting developments, um, which we hope to pursue more uh, this summer. Um, yes, there is an app for this as well. Uh, we developed the app for the monitoring group. Um, for the cyano monitoring component, and uh, last year was the kind of the testing for it, uh, the beta version where we piloted it, and a lot of folks found they didn't really use it that much. They thought it was easier because of the collection of the sample and the freezing of the samples that they could just quickly collect those samples, freeze them, and then do all the analysis later in the fall um, or after the season ended. Um, but give you an idea what this app is and uh, where it might have certain applications uh, for folks that might uh, just be doing ambient sampling. Again, it's very similar in format to what uh, you saw the previous apps, um, name, email address, phone numbers, organization. It's got basically uh, five different forms here, uh, water body stations, uh, sample information, analysis information, and then the submittal of the of the data to the database. Um, so quickly through the forms, um, we have a water body ID, which can be, um, you can pre-load these. So if you're a state uh, water quality agency and you have water bodies are already named that you want to use that nomenclature, you can put that in. Um, there, you can put in your water body name, uh, state, town, etc. Each page that you go to, uh, you update the information you put in from the preceding page, and it lists it up here in the header so that you know uh, you can kind of check it without having to go back to the previous page and look at it and double check it. It lists it there. Um, so from your water body to your station screen, you put in a station ID. It can generate it automatically, or you can put in your own. Uh, you, what type of, of sample is it? Is it a shore sample, or is it a um, on-lake sample? Station description, automatic uh, coordinates put in uh, by getting coordinates. And again, you update the database and it lists your information up here, uh, your water body ID, your station ID, and then you can put in your sample ID uh, for taking, um, and that can be automatically generated as well. Field crew, uh, is it a sample rep, is it a duplicate? Uh, or is it a single sample? What type of methodology did you use? Did you use an integrated sampler, tube, or a net sampler? Uh, weather, surface conditions, same as in the other apps. Uh, sample depth, depth is standardized to one or three meters, depending on whether it's shoreside or on lake. Though if your lake is shallower, like some lakes in Rhode Island where you might have just barely a meter in depth, uh, you can put in a, other, a different number than that. Sample date, sample time, and then you've updated your uh, screen again. So you've got um, water body ID, site ID, sample ID, and then you can analyze out the lake, and you get a generate analysis ID as well. Um, so that can be automatically generated or, again, put in yourself. And uh, the date of the uh, analysis analyst name, et cetera, and so on. And then through uh, some uh, samples for using the fluorometer, if they're very dense samples, uh, you might have to dilute that. So we have a dilution uh, um, toggle here. Um, filtering we do not use anymore. That is a 
a revision that is uh, being updated, and then whether the sample is frozen or not, um, and uh, sample temperature. Um, photos can be taken as well. And then the parameter, since it's two channels, it can either be phycocyanin or chlorophyll so that is put in as well. Um, and then you can submit your data, and that goes into the database. Uh, this still needs work, but that's kind of where we are, how we've set up the methodology to date. Um, and that's most of the talk. Just a summary and next steps. Uh, again, we have the three different components. We have the bloom watch component, cyanoscope, and cyanomonitoring, starting from the bare bones of the smartphone app, submission into tipsci.org. Cyanoscope using uh, more of the separation of the cyanobacteria, microscope, uh, higher resolution images into iNaturalist um, for uh, expert kind of consensus uh, rating of the photos, and then um, the monitoring, which I just went uh, through. Uh, what we're looking towards this summer is uh, kind of getting this all out to people through training through more um, public awareness at uh, lake associations, um, um, <clears throat> conferences, that sort of thing. And also we will have available to us this summer a uh, mobile field laboratory. This is shown on the right here. It's not exclusively bought or made for cyanobacteria monitoring, but it is a tool that we can put to use this summer um, for training purposes. And we hope Possibly by the end of the summer uh, that we can start uh, doing some ELISA testing for toxins in conjunction with our PC chlorophyll A work that Nancy has worked on. And um, we're going to try to garner uh, support from different water suppliers within the region to look at this forecasting pilot project, uh, which we hope to pull together for the summer as well. And uh, that's it for my talk. Sorry it took uh, longer than we hoped and was uh, hard getting off the ground, um, but um, that's pretty much it. So if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to try to answer them for you.